in five, four, three. We're back for another exciting episode of The Spicy Life. I am your relationship expert and magnetic matchmaker, Spicy Mari, and here with me in the G-Spot to bring another fabulous and amazing episode is the beautiful, the lovely, Dr. Shannon Chavez. Woo! Thanks for having me. The crowd goes wild. <laughs> Okay, so as usual, I have to read her amazing bio to give you a little backstory on today's episode because we're gonna dive into five signs that he is emotionally unavailable. And uh, love all of your expertise, but I have to share with them what it is. So I'm gonna read your bio right now. Okay, so you can get nice and like bashful while I read out loud. <laughs> Shannon Chavez is a nationally recognized expert, therapist, and educator specializing in all things sexuality, including help for men, women, LGBTQIA, and couples, the treatment of sexual disorders, sex education for conservative religious and cultural groups, sexual trauma and abuse, and compulsive behavior surrounding love, romance, and sex. She's a licensed clinical psychologist in California and Arizona with a private practice in Beverly Hills, where she works with individuals and couples of all genders and orientations to address sexual concerns and build sexual awareness through therapy, coaching, and education. She also wrote a guide for clinicians on the treatment of love addiction through the use of attachment-oriented psychodynamic therapy, proving she has actually written the book on it. She earned her doctorate in clinical psychology and master's degree in psychology with an emphasis in marriage and family therapy from the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. She completed a two-year postdoctoral fellowship at the Institute of Sexual Health in Beverly Hills, California, treating sex addiction, compulsivity, and sexual dysfunction. Whoa, that's okay. a mouthful. <laughs> And mind you guys, I took a paragraph and a half out of her bio. Like it was, a, it was a long, but it was well deserved because this woman knows her stuff, which is why I had to have her in for today's episode. Because who better to talk about living a spicy life than this woman right here? So to warm you up, we're gonna start with you playing a little game. It's uh, all right. It's, it's a part of the spice breaker. Okay, so on this, <laughs> what is this called? A, a dart chart. <laughs> I have some spicy, uh, spice, spicy tips right here that actually make you do certain things. Um, we're gonna get a little freaky. So whatever it lands on, <laughs> boop, 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 that's what you have to do for us to warm you up. Ready? Here's the I ball. Think, I think I'm ready. Do I get one ball? Put, put the two balls. Two balls in your hand. If we don't like the first one, we shoot again. Okay. So you have to give me a 20 second massage. The other option. Go again. <laughs> I, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna gun for the massage. Ooh, but I like this one more. You have to tell a love story. Oh. So give us a 30 second love story. How about how you met your husband? All right, perfect. So my love story. I met my husband. We actually used to work together and Ooh, love we, affair. And then I had my rules perfect. of not dating anyone that you work with. Mm -hmm. So he patiently waited until I left the job, asked me out, and we had our first date at a Depeche Mode concert, which is one of our favorite bands. Ooh. And it was it was love after that. So we bonded on music and similar interests and him patiently waiting. So that's oh my, my love story. Right now we've been together for twelve years, married for six years. So he's in the industry as well. He's not actually. He's, he's not. A, he's a restaurant owner. So oh. he's in the restaurant industry. But I say oh. we're both in the pleasure business because okay. I do <laughs> sex therapy and but he, he, uh, he's in your mouth. And he he thinks people. <laughs> I love that. I love that. We don't uh, even. We're not even usually open to people in our workplace because right. you know HR tries to tell us you know avoid that you know right. confrontation and stuff like that that can come up while you're in the workplace. But I mean, it sounds like he waited and he was patient. He was patient. And you guys have a crush and I'm sorry. persistent, which you know sometimes pays. I wouldn't wait till. I wouldn't wait till you have to like you know wait till you move on from positions. I would holler. Spicy tip. <laughs> that you are interested in someone maybe inviting them to happy hour or inviting them you know to something outside of the workplace so at least it's not done you know before that like presentation but <laughs> or you develop know, the friendship right develop the friendship, and let it yeah. kind of build over time hang out with them so it gets personal right. yeah make it make sure they're thinking about you right and, and don't forget about you through that process i love your love story <laughs> because that's like amazing that he was patient like that i on the other hand i'd be like okay you're going out with me tomorrow um, <laughs> hey, when you know what you want. I, I like that. I like 
like somebody who knows what they want. <laughs> he sounds like an awesome guy. He is, he's a great partner. So I love that you are gonna be able to give us insight into on his emotional availability as well, but to start off, you have to give us SPICY. And for those who don't know, SPICY is self, passion, intimacy, communication, and learning to say yes. So you have to answer our first question, when did you fall in love with yourself? Ooh, you know what, that took a long time because I think we talk about self-love but we don't practice self-love. Mm. And I think it was after starting my own business and I realized I had to wear so many hats. Yeah. And falling in love with myself was learning that you have to balance work and life, you have to take time off, you have to give yourself permission yeah. to uh, take care of yourself, to make yourself happy. So I kind of fell in love with myself because I had to learn how to do that. And then also giving yourself the credit when you are running your own business and doing all of the work. Yeah. You don't always get a boss or someone saying, hey, good job, or here's your review. Sure. So giving myself that feedback helped me appreciate what I was doing. So you fell in love with yourself when you started walking in your purpose. Yes. Exactly. Beautiful. Yes, I did. And so then that's my next question. How did you discover your life's passion? P is for passion. Yes. You know, well, becoming a sex therapist, everyone wanted to know, how did I get into this work? I was always curious about sex. So for <laughs> me, I knew that this was something that made people feel uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but I was always comfortable talking about it, even though I was a really shy kid, actually. I was the observer, so I would watch, I would see what everyone was up to, yeah. but I would listen to everyone's stories. So that got me into wanting to help people around sex, because I think sex is such an important part of our being, why we're here, we need connections, so I really wanted to develop a way to help people find that in their life. And you're doing a masterful job at that. <laughs> you have to do this eye for intimacy. What is your biggest turn on? And it's physical intimacy. Ooh, yes. <laughs> uh, physical intimacy, uh, I would say creativity. Oh, really? So when someone is creative, thinks outside of the box, especially when it comes to physical intimacy, mm -hmm. because things can get boring, you can get in a routine, but someone who's creative. So if you like, surprises you with something. Yes, I like surprises. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Surprises, you know, something yeah. different. Exactly. Novelty is important for desire in the long run. Absolutely. And then you have to give a C for communication. What is the biggest compliment that you've ever received from anyone? Biggest compliment? The best one. Uh, probably s someone complimenting uh, my hard work hmm. and ability to get through challenges. Yeah. You know, I tend to think of myself as not very calm, but when people compliment you on that, you're like, oh, thank you. Thank you for noticing that. Right. <laughs> always a nice compliment when people appreciate that. Appreciate your hustle. Love it. Love it. <laughs> okay, and the last one, when, this is for yes, share a time when you conquered a fear. You were afraid of something conquered and you were like, fear. forget it, we're doing it. You know, it's probably moving out to California because I didn't know anyone out here and I came out here and I completely uh, changed the path of what I was working on in my career in order to really start this business. So it, it, there was a lot of fears because people were trying to talk me out of the work. Oh, really? Especially coming from the background that I did. Mm -hmm. Psychology was kind of taboo and it wasn't really looked at as a career. You know, why would it, don't, people don't go to therapy, especially in my culture. So for me, it was overcoming the fear of what, you know, people not supporting your work yeah. and really showing them that this was something that I was passionate about. So you had the courage and you were like, no, forget it, I'm gonna do it anyway. I'm gonna do it anyway. And I did it anyway. Even when no one's believing in you, you gotta do it anyway. Got it. Exactly. Okay, so on today's episode, we're gonna dive into it because this is something that comes up often in uh, my work on the show. When we have guests, it's always this, you know, sad and unfortunate truth about men sometimes being emotionally unavailable. Yes. But luckily we're at a time where we can speak on it and they can get the help that they need. Mm -hmm. And we're promoting that help even more. But I want you to go a little bit into how a man detaches from emotional intimacy uh, during physical intimacy, right? Because it seems like they have no problem with the sexual part, but when it comes to the emotional part, there's a disconnect. Right. right. How do they turn it off? You know, for some it's a choice and for others it's not. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk about the choice first. So there may be a part of them that may decide that physical inti or emotional intimacy is too overwhelming. So by turning it off, they may disconnect during sex, they may focus on only their pleasures. Mm -hmm. So they're not really connecting with their partner's experience. So it's all about their personal gratification. 
and that's a choice because the connection that they may have with the person may be overwhelming or for them there's this idea or expectation around if I do open up myself in that way that maybe the person gets too attached or I send the wrong message. So I, I think they do it by focusing on their own needs and not being selfish. Right, and not <laughs> that's a nice way of saying it. Yes. <laughs> okay. And then and for those that's not a choice, I want to talk about that oh, because talk that's about important that. too. Okay. So when it's not a choice, I say a lot of that comes from trauma. So mm -hmm. early experiences, it could be trauma like neglect or early attachment experiences with parents where their needs were not met. So it's a survival. <clears throat> excuse me, a survival mechanism mm -hmm. not to emotionally attach out of safety. You're protecting your own feelings by doing that. But is it something that you believe they can turn on, turn off, when the right person comes along, they're telling themselves that that's when they're finally gonna do it and be you know, emotionally available and commit and be all in. Is it something that they can just turn on for the right person or is it something that they have to work through on their own and they shouldn't wait until they're in a relationship to try to practice that. I think you have to do a lot of the work because it may be conscious or it may be unconscious. You may be actually attracting people that are also emotionally unavailable or the same patterns and relationships in order to protect yourself. Yeah. So until you do that work, you get to come to terms with what this is all about. Yeah. Why are you doing that? Or is it really fulfilling you to be in these emotionally detached relationships? And what are you really getting out of it? I think there could be a lot that you're missing and not really realizing your full potential in the relationship. But it seems like men are functioning just fine without it though, without, you know, in their minds, although they may not be creating healthy relationships, they're not even aware or conscious of the fact that there's a disconnect or that there's something wrong. They don't see it maybe as something wrong. They just see it as us being, as women, you know, too emotional. Mm -hmm. Or they're hiding it really well. Yeah. Right? I think there's a lot of fear of what will people think of me? Mm -hmm. Will I be judged if I really tell them that this isn't fulfilling for me? Or there's just a, a social norm around it being okay. Mm -hmm. So there can sometimes be this trend of, oh yeah, it's fine to just sleep around and not detach or yeah. be detached because it's it's uh, having fun or it's normalized because of your age or you know we don't have to commit until later on. So there's a lot of these unspoken rules that I think normalizes that. And so that would, that speaks to the culture though, this cultural shift of us just having meaningless sex, right? Like it's like a gift and a curse. It's kind of like, yes, we finally get sexual independence and freedom and we get to, you know, sleep with whomever we want, but then it also creates this uh, lack of accountability when it comes to, you know, our generation that maybe is like, well, I don't need to commit. Like I can get the milk and I don't have to buy the cow. Right, and I think even casual sex has emotional connection. So I think there's also this myth that you only experience emotional connection in intimate relationships or relationships that are committed, but I think even casual sex, you're experiencing emotional connection, but we may not realize it. So I think there's just a lot of misconception and misinformation for people out there, especially in these different types of relationships. Yeah, and it gets, it, it gets, tricky right because you start living with someone and you think you can handle it and then all of a sudden you're three months four months six months in and you're like dang wait but i wish they would choose me right and that's the part that sex for i think of what uh, which i know a lot of women go through is the no i can handle it or they've also turned off their emotional vulnerability so that that way it doesn't affect them or, or it doesn't hurt them but then now you have two people who are doing the same thing as opposed to us kind of you know guiding our men. Exactly. Or you know, if you cut off from your own needs, then you may end up being resentful towards the person. Right, which usually happens. <laughs> taking on the emotional burden of that, mm -hmm. which is now I'm feeling the depression or what's coming along with that. And it could be what the other person is projecting onto you, which I think is also a problem. So I think we need to communicate. We need to be open about our needs and not be ashamed of them. I think the more you own your needs, the more confident you feel because you're not embarrassed about it. It's easier to speak about it yeah. and there's no insecurity. What are the like first beginning signs of what we should look for when someone is emotionally unavailable? When a guy is, and I'll do a whole other episode for us ladies, but just for the men in particular, for women right now who are in relationships or men who are in relationships with men, Tell us what are some of the signs or indicators when we're first at that beginning stage of dating. We just swiped, 
now we're going on the date tonight. What should we be looking for to see if they're tapped in? Right, I would say just communication in general. If you find that this person is kind of uh, present but then not present, you don't really know what's going on in their life, they don't disclose a lot of what's happening, you may find that they're inconsistent in what they are communicating. Mm -hmm. So they may be saying, hey, here's what's going on, but not really seeing that in their behavior. And then also, too, I think uh, they may be kind of neutral. Sometimes when you see emotions, people can run kind of hot and cold. But if you notice them kind of neutral and not really reactive to things going on, that can also be a sign that they're just really not attached and present. Yeah. And so I think we want to look out for that because that may be, these may be the red flags that you're not paying attention to, or you may be wanting that relationship so much that you're putting on a lot of that onto the relationship and not talking about it. So how do you confront, or what does that conversation look like when someone's not tapped in, when they're not present? What does that conversation look like? What's going on? I think real vulnerability and honesty to just say, what is going on? What are you looking for? I think we wait too long to really talk about values in a relationship, yep. what we're looking yes. for, what we want. And then we assume that that's going to happen at a point and that we'll kind of meet at the same place. I think that's the fantasy versus reality. The reality is we need to talk about that early on because we're putting in a lot of time and effort and if you're not getting your needs met, yeah. then what is it? It's not really a relationship. Even friendships, you know, if you're not getting your needs met in a friendship, you probably would confront that friend Correct. and talk about Correct. that as a problem. But with relationships, we tend to let things go or excuse things. So I think er the earlier the better. The earlier you notice it, the better. That way you can start practicing the communication skills that you would need in a, in a committed relationship or walk away if it's not the right fit. But we're so afraid though of pushing the person away, right? Because if we address it too soon, we're concerned that the person's gonna think that we're quote unquote thirsty. Mm -hmm. So beginning of the relationship, date one may not be necessarily the time to say like, what are you looking for or is it? Like let us know. I think day one, you're really meeting the person for the first time. So I would say think of that as just kind of paying attention to who is this person, how do they show up, what's their energy like, what's their body yeah. language. You want to ask questions, but don't make it an interview where you might scare the person off. You may not, you may know it that after that first date that you're not really invested in the second date. So I would wait after that and then start talking about values. What are you looking for? And I wouldn't be scared to say that because if the person runs and they're overwhelmed yeah. by that, that's already an indication that they're not the right fit. And if they are asking you questions and they're curious about your values, so important. questions are important. Right. They're, you know, the curiosity to figure out who you are, I think, shows a person's investment and yeah. interest in you. I've called people out before on dates. We've gone out and it was kind of lackluster. I was talking, asking questions, but they weren't inquiring and they did not feel present. And I busted them out like, sorry, this will not be happening again. This was not a successful date. Um, I felt like you were disconnected and I like was uh, transparent with it. <laughs> and they were like, wait, I was though. And I'm like, no, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. And I just, I don't have time to like, go on this date again and experience this because I don't believe that you even really want to be here. Like I was just 100% honest. Um, but which they, is liberating which for you. It was liberating for me, yeah. I let them be released and not try again. And usually I would give multiple chances if they also weren't super boring. Um, so <laughs> usually I'd be like, okay, let's do this again. And I'm like, no, yeah, you're just not a fun person. Um, but I'm but always curious honesty. about that though, mm -hmm. right? When someone says, no, 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 let's do it again. You know, what are they really looking for? They're, they're showing up and they're not present and they're just not connecting. It, it just, it, to me, what kind of void are they feeling in their life? That part. With the day and, you know, I get curious about that, but also, you know, they're committing to the time to meet up, right, and to be there, but not be present. So I don't really, I'm curious what they're getting out of it. Sometimes it's just attention. Sometimes we just want to feel like we're seen or someone is spending time with us and so, to avoid the feeling of being alone, we think that another body will take that away, right? We think that it's gonna fulfill the fact that we aren't in a relationship or that we don't maybe necessarily want the commitment, but the actual time spending with someone, we're like at least absorbing, you know, the energy from someone else. And sometimes that can be draining within itself. Like you go on so many dates and it's just with, you know, guys or girls 
who don't really want a relationship, they're just playing games, that's not a healthy behavior right there because now you're wasting your freaking time. <laughs> you're giving all your energy away. You're giving all your energy. <laughs> that's right though, filling that void. I yeah. talk to a lot of my clients about that. You know, what are you really hungry for when you're looking for love or sex or whatever it is you're looking for in your life? Yeah. You could be filling up your this void with and using relationships like that. Yeah, and absolutely. It can become compulsive for a lot of people. Oh my gosh, so especially around the loneliness. You mentioned and, earlier something so important. You said, um, oh, you were married before dating apps came out. Mm -hmm. And you and I started having a conversation about how I love apps because they have actually grown my business because it's more opportunities for people to try and uh, learn mm -hmm. that they are not the most amazing <laughs> person in the world and there's actually work to be done. So they come to me after experiencing a, you know, a certain amount of lack of success. But what apps have done though is created a culture of swiping and going out mm -hmm. and consistently dating and dating and dating to the point where now they are addicted to the validation mm -hmm. of being seen or being swiped on or going out and yes. just landing that date. People sure. who may before not have had such a pop in dating or social life are now able to consistently find someone, but it also makes you not as present in that date when you know that you can go home later on that night and find someone else by swiping. And it's fantasy driven. You're looking at a photo and determining whether or not you're compatible with the person, they're attractive, yeah. there's someone you want to hang out with. There's no real relational uh, attachment yeah. or connection with this person. So I think of it as fantasy driven because we may be focusing on certain qualities. We may look at something they wrote in their profile and mm -hmm. connect with that, or they like to hike, I like to hike. And so we start developing all these ways that we're measuring our compatibility rather than actually meeting the person and sensing that from a date. So sometimes people get stuck on the dating apps. I see my clients do. Yeah. That. We're, we're texting for weeks or months actually. Yep. We have this great rapport, but they're not going out and meeting. And I encourage them to do that, but there's also a vulnerability there. Yeah. You know, well, I really like talking with them on the app. And what if we don't like talking in real person, in real life? <laughs> what do we do about you it? You probably shouldn't be dating if you don't like talking in real life to exactly, them. Exactly. But that's a huge concern. They, they almost get comfortable there. And that's meeting their needs, so yeah. they don't need the dating. Well, I always get them to the point, or they always come to the point with me when it's the, how do I transition this into a date? Right. Because we've been messaging for weeks now and they haven't asked to spend time with me, now what do I do? Right. And so one of the things that I work with is actually how to you know, break the ice, spice breakers, that will lead them to the date and quicker. And hey, before even the date, how do I get you on the phone or FaceTime? Yes. So that I can make sure that I'm not wasting my time by getting dressed, putting on $200 worth of makeup, and then like stepping out. And you know, and only exactly. to not enjoy it. Like let's have a conversation first before we even go out. Right. I'm glad you push people to do that. Oh, we need yeah. that. Come on, make the next. But we're step. all shy, right? We're all kind of nervous. Like, what if the person rejects us? What are they going to think? I we have we have this obsession with acceptance. Yes. And so that is what prevents us and creates this fear that blocks us from moving to the next step with someone, whether it be in a relationship, whether it be dating, whether it be sometimes even in friendship or in our you know social circles. Mm -hmm. It's like, what are people going to think? And I'm like, okay, but if we don't make the effort, they're, you're not gonna even know. Like you will never, you will never know. It's like a 50 50 shot. What do we have to lose? <laughs> and the sensitivity towards rejection. You know, mm -hmm. I think rejection is intentional and if someone does it intentionally to hurt you. But when someone says, hey, I'm not interested, it's not really a rejection. I would look at it as this person is taking care of me. This person is wasting my time. It's a gift. Right. They're being honest. They're being uh, intimate by yeah. sharing how they really feel. It's only rejection if someone is doing it to intentionally evoke an emotion. So I think we're in this culture where we're so sensitive to rejection mm -hmm. or the idea of other people saying no or standing up for themselves. We're measuring our entire worth by that. Yeah. That we need to be more aware that it's our responsibility to to fulfill our worth and yep. to define that. It's not another person. And if we're giving another person that power to do that, yeah. then we're already setting ourselves up for, not failure, but for a lot of problems when it comes to dating. Oh no, for sure. And, and, and part of what we're talking about today though is the emotionally unavailable man. When we fall for that person, who we may recognize the red flags, recognize the signs, and we decide to pursue them anyways, 
now we are left to pick up the pieces when it's a self-fulfilling prophecy of well i knew they were going to disappoint me because they showed me these signs but i thought that they would come around and they liked me more or i thought that you know i could change their opinion and i knew they weren't going to want me so then it winds up being they don't want you right, right. but you attracted them for a reason and you gave them a lot of power to define your self-worth by wanting you or thinking you can change them and then you ended up feeling disappointed yeah. or again not worthy or not good enough and I think that's an individual's personal work to do because if that's kind of what you're doing with dating then you're using your external environment to fulfill your needs rather than doing it on your own and to me that tells me there needs to be some work around your attachment mm -hmm. wounds that may come from early parts of life or uh, really looking at patterns in your relationship it could have come patterns, from a yes. traumatic experience that you're just replaying that pattern because patterns are familiar mm -hmm. so even if they're dysfunctional they provide us with comfort yep. so we need to look at them and be able to say right even though this is familiar is it fulfilling my needs? Is this really good for me? Or do I need to work on this so that I'm not attracting the same thing over and over again? Well, I feel like there is a difference though in the amount of women and men who are getting proper mental health. Mm -hmm. Yes. And when it comes to us women, we're naturally gonna, we're reading books, we're acquiring, we're absorbing information. Especially when we get hurt, we're looking for outlets of how can we heal? How can we heal? When it comes to men, they're not constantly actively looking, how can I heal, right? Because oftentimes to even admit that you need healing means that you're hurting and hurting for men isn't socially acceptable. Exactly. How can we encourage our men more? I think we can encourage it by talking about male concerns, normalizing this, being able to provide spaces for men to heal, especially whether it's mental health or workshops or anything that really caters to the male experience when it comes to kind of building up vulnerability. You know, even talking about the words male and intimacy, we don't hear a lot about right. that. You know, men true. dealing with intimacy problems, we think of it as, you know, we have the stereotype. You know, men are not as emotional as females. There's no truth to that. Emotions are not gendered. So I think we need to be better at our education and what we're putting out there. I think the media has to be better at sending the right messages so we're not creating yeah judgment or stereotypes about someone's experience because a lot of people suffer in silence and isolate mm -hmm. and they never get the help they need and it comes to a point where they're in a relationship and maybe in a long-term relationship where there's betrayal or hurt and then everything falls apart before getting to that place of help. So they've hit rock bottom and everything's yeah. falling apart before they actually get the right resources. So I think it has to be more of a global social shift and change where we start talking about it, normalizing it. But you just said right now uh, that what we're doing as a society is saying that women are more emotional and that men are. So we're replaying that message over and over. And then what happens when that message gets played over, we buy into it and we start behaving that way. We start accepting the differences between their behavior and their expressions. And we start being actually like approving, like approving, <laughs> right? Because we're like, oh, well, you know, he's a guy, so that's how guys are versus holding them accountable to actually like tap in. Exactly, those myths. And I think beliefs are really powerful. We can have all oh, these yes, thoughts please. in our minds, but when we create a belief, there's an emotion attached to it. So if we say all men are like this, mm -hmm. you know, women are like that, it starts to be, not only normalizing it, but that affects how we behave. Mm -hmm. That affects how we accept different behavior in our lives. And so I think we have to have better beliefs. What's some of the harm involved for a male? Speak to a male. What is some of the harm involved for a male who continuously sleeps around or has meaningless sex? Mm -hmm. Not all men have meaningless sex. However, for those that do, that this may be penetrating them and they need to be spoken to, the ones who continue having meaningless sex and aren't looking for a commitment, they just want the connection or the hookup, what's some of the harm that can happen to them personally? Mm -hmm. Well, if they do have some of that past wounding or trauma in their history, if they're continuing to fill this void, they could develop things like addiction, depression, more mental health concerns. So I think you want to think of the long-term effects mm -hmm. of continuing to use sex as a way to cope 
And so if you're using sex in an unhealthy way, then obviously there's going to become a point where it's not even about physical gratification anymore. Yeah. It becomes a need in order to function, in order to feel whole. And so for that, in the long term, you can develop a lot of other conditions, mental health conditions, even relational problems. Mm -hmm. So the earlier you address it, the better you can figure out a, a better path for yourself, especially in a relationship. Because if it's affecting your romantic relationships, I imagine it's affecting your work relationships, family dynamics, yeah. friendships, you know, intimacy is intimacy. So I think you want to look at it from all angles and be able to address how it's affecting your life as a whole. Yeah, address the sex addiction. So we hear oftentimes, that's not real. He just likes to have a lot of sex. Mm -hmm. Can you speak on what sex addiction is and how to recognize the signs if you do have that? Because some men joke around and even say that they do have it and they don't really know what those symptoms look like. Yes, yes. There's a lot of misconception about sex addiction. So it's not actually an addiction. In the field, we call it out of control sexual behavior. And what that means is it functions like a, an anxiety disorder or they're using sex in order to cope with some underlying issue. So why it's a problem is because it can continue to escalate. And the more you use sex to cope, what's happening is that you're going to continue to have this cycle of shame around sex. So even though you're using sex to feel better, once the sex is done, the it's cycle continues. You, yeah. So until you address that underlying piece, you're going to continue to use it in unhealthy ways. And so I, I think there's also a misconception of, if I like sex and I have a high drive, does that mean I'm a sex addict? No. So people that have out of control behavior, that even though they're using sex, they may not be enjoying it. Yeah. They may feel isolated. They're continuing to use it despite negative consequences. Mm -hmm. And so it's not really about sex or intimacy. It actually can feel very lonely, isolating. And I think for many people, it's about looking at how it's affecting every other area of your life. Mm. And for people, they may say, you know, I'm, I'm, my behavior is so out of control that I'm you know, not going to work. I don't have any friends in my life. I have no social connection at all. So those are the things I look for when I'm assessing. Those are the extreme cases? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And for those that have a high drive, that's that's normal. As long as you're using it in a consensual, healthy way, mm -hmm. celebrate it. There's no norm as far as what's enough or too much. As long as you're practicing safe sex, healthy sex, then enjoy it. Enjoy being a sexual being. Speak to the high drive part, right? Yes. Because sometimes we may have a high drive, uh, and this goes for men and women. Sometimes one of the people in the relationship, or when you're dating, or in you know your partnership, one of you guys has a high drive and the other person doesn't. What accounts for the high drive versus lack of drive. What are some of the things that can affect your sexual drive? Oh, so many things. Stress, definitely. Uh, I think also desire discrepancies are so normal. Mm -hmm. I think our sexuality changes daily, so we don't always have the same drive. I think it kind of ebbs and flows throughout the relationship. So I think sometimes High drive can be, you know, a person who just has a lot of energy mm -hmm. and that's really what libido is. It's energy we put towards things we desire. And sometimes we're putting too much energy into sex yeah. and we may need to look at other areas of our Spread life. Out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, use it and see other areas that maybe that's career, maybe that's hobbies, passions, things that make yes. you feel full in your life. Mm -hmm. uh, pleasure, you know, we are pleasure seekers since birth. Yes. You know, if you think about infants to adulthood, we are pleasure seekers, so it's a good thing. But sometimes we need to look at other ways to experience pleasure. Enough. Sex can't be our only pleasure. <laughs> right, I mean, it's fun, it's connection, but it's not always available. And so for low desire people, I think you want to look at what's going on in your life that may be draining your energy. And sometimes that can be relationships, sometimes that can be family, yeah. it can be things going on in your life, and it's not always one thing, so it's not one factor. So if I address my stress, I'm going to all of a sudden feel all this desire and be ready to have sex all the time. It's about really evaluating how everything is in balance, and learning to take care of yourself is at the core of it, for sure. Most people don't know how to take care of themselves, though. I feel like we have a lot of things that we tell women on what they should do to take care of themselves. What should we tell men to do to take care of themselves? 
Right, I can talk about your emotions, be able to process what's coming up for you and not think of it as, you know, sensitive or this is a female thing, but really normalizing that this is a human thing. Yeah. We are emotional creatures, so we need to be able to process our emotions and talk about it. Processing is so, so helpful. You know, we're also social beings, so we're not designed to just keep it all in. We are designed to talk about it, to bring it up, to, to get insight and to learn from one another. We also model behavior. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a social environment with a bunch of, you know, guy guys <laughs> and no one's talking about their feelings and everyone's just kind of normalizing that that's not cool or it's too sensitive to do that, then you may also be modeling that behavior mm -hmm. and reinforcing that. So I think we need to have better models for males to look at, you know, part of masculinity and being a male is also being able to take care of yourself, self-care, processing feelings, talking about it, being able to learn intimacy skills as a male, even within social environment, I think is helpful. How, so so uh, that's, I want you to paint that for a lot of men, they think the therapy is the only way, right? Some of them still aren't comfortable with therapy, but you just said social environments. So that means maybe bringing up or having conversations amongst your group of friends that may make you uncomfortable. Exactly. Or, or you know, I, I did a workshop for a group of men that have an entrepreneurial business group. So it wasn't meant to be a therapy group mm -hmm. of any sort. Smart. But what I loved about these guys is they said, you know what? In our group, we've started to talk about relationships and we all kind of have the same questions. So we thought about bringing a therapist in to talk to us about sex and relationships. Mm -hmm. So for them, you know, look at the environment you're already in and maybe that can be a place to start and bring in some resources. You know, have someone come and talk to you. Smart, or, smart, you know, smart. read a book together. So everyone, like a men's book club where you're all reading <laughs> uh, books about relationships I love that. and That's a give good each other one. tips. But I, I think, you know, look at the environment you're already in and, and don't be afraid to open up the conversation because I think what will happen is you'll realize that we're all going through the same stuff. Yeah. And that it's not abnormal for any of us to say, hey, you know, I'm struggling with this in my relationship or I'm feeling like I'm not able to connect with a partner the way I want. And that can really be, you know, you can do lifelong healing just through being able to bring it up and talk about it. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> but sometimes that fear gets in the way or you know you don't want it to turn into a fight or we have a million excuses why we may not be having that conversation with the partner as a woman if you are in a relationship with an emotionally unavailable man or you're dating someone who's emotionally unavailable is there a way that and i am answering my own question i know that there is but i want you to i want you to I, um, I want you to give us an example of a conversation that you may have with your husband, right? He's not meeting a need of yours. Maybe it's time. Maybe he hasn't been taking you on um, enough dates. He's working too much. You work full time too. So we both of you guys are out here hustling. However, your emotional needs aren't being fulfilled. What does that conversation look like with the hubby? We'll use your personal. Yes, and I'm, I'm happy to talk about this because I think we do so much of our learning and healing in our relationships. Mm -hmm. So we have to be realistic about our expe expectations. Our partners are not mind readers. They Correct. don't know how we're feeling and thinking. So our main goal in communication should be understanding. So if I'm talking to my husband about my needs, I have to communicate it in a way where I'm not just blaming him for the way that I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. That's not what you want to do. You want to help him understand how you're feeling and describe it, not with too much words too. We tend to over communicate when we're feeling uh, you know, undervalued or our needs aren't being met. And by that I mean we may be telling this narrative with all these details and our poor partners are saying, wait, what, what, what is she upset about? Oh my gosh. What did I do? This is a spicy tip right here. I love this. <laughs> yeah, so it, you we know, don't need to over explain. <laughs> yeah, be concise and direct. I'm feeling like this and this is what I need. Here's how I think we can address this. Also give a solution. You don't want to dump out all this stuff and then say, hey honey, what, what should you do about right. it? You know, it's about a collaboration. This is what I want to see happen. happen. Like, exactly. You're working don't on this make team. Them, yeah, you know, yes. work together <laughs> and figure it out. So yeah, be concise, be direct. Don't use so many words that your partner doesn't know what you're talking about. You know, strive for understanding and also, be creative about solutions. Mm -hmm. So we may have a fantasy of what the solution is. My yeah. solution is he drops everything. And <laughs> we're going, going with, you know, all all day. From <laughs> day. But I think be realistic. Look at, you know, be considerate and compassionate about where they're coming from as well. 
so I think you want to you know think about that beforehand and also you want to set time aside for that communication yes, you don't want to do yep. it you know um, at the end of the night when you're both exhausted you don't want to do it when they're in the middle of something and they can't give you your full yep. attention I like to schedule time and it doesn't have to be you know right here at this time yep. we're talking but you may say you know hey honey can we you know talk for 20 minutes at the end of the night about something that's been on my mind so you I like time limits with communication because what we don't want to do oh, is beautiful. say we need to talk. Right. How much of a trigger <laughs> is that in a relationship? What, what do we need to talk about? But you say, hey, I have something on my mind and I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes and see what your thoughts are. So that way you already know what the frame is for that communication and it's not triggering for both of you. You could both go oh in gosh. with so much anxiety and your walls up and now you're not you're not present for each other, you're feeling overwhelmed, and that's really not your intention. Your intention is, I want him to understand how I'm feeling. Literally had this the other night, so I love and agree with everything that you are saying. I know better and give this advice all the time. I am not a perfect person, so what happens? The other night I was being passive about something, so I decided that I was gonna tell my husband in the shower um, while we were having like a great day, I was gonna tell him you know, something that was going on that it was been bothering me, and I'm like, oh, it turned into you know a fight, and I know better. I should have scheduled an appointment when it comes to going over some things that I want us to work on in the relationship. And what happens in that dynamic is it is this you know imploding, uh, you know, and just unloading of emotions and feelings, and men have to be prepared for that. Like they aren't in that you know state of mind 24 7 and oftentimes we are more connected and in our fields and so finding the right time to deliver it I love 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 that you said that because I literally just was guilty of this the other night um and it probably felt good for you because sometimes it does like, like oh, oh I got it all out but it's not productive for both of you right, right but I also hate the fact that it like only proves that I'm not perfect and I'm like oh <laughs> this example <laughs> write it down for us. I do believe in journaling and I know people go, oh, journaling, it's a therapy thing, but it's so effective to get out what's in and sometimes seeing your own words can help you design that conversation for you. That's a your beautiful partner. tip. And even if it's, okay, you know, here's all the stuff on my mind, I don't really need to tell him all that, but here's what I want him to know. That's always a really great way to organize that. One of the spicy tips that I tell my clients as well is to do a spicy tip jar. You don't always get to complain. Like, sorry, you guys gotta work through this. Just because you have 50 million things that you you know want to talk about doesn't mean that it's always the best timing, right? Because you still want to enjoy the relationship as well. Sure. So if you just put one of those tips in the jar every week of you know, hey, this may be something that I would like us to work on, but you don't get to just put the negative thing in the jar. You have to follow it up with the positive. Mm -hmm. I love this about you. I would like us to do this, but it's also coming with something positive while you're delivering something mm -hmm. negative. So when they reach for that jar or it's time you know, to go in that jar, it's not just a jar full of 50 things that you want each other to work on. <laughs> Actually, you said something good too, the positive too. Yeah. Because I find that a lot of the couples I work with do that. They're only talking about the things that need work, yeah. need change, but I always try to encourage them to think about what are you doing well? What's going well? What are the things that you're enjoying? Yeah. What are the things that you're proud of that you've really improved over time by talking about it? And so we need feedback. Even in sex, we need feedback. What are you enjoying? What am I doing well? Give me a report card of what's going really well with sex. When should you give feedback on sexual pleasure or displeasure? Is it while you're having sex and you're guiding their body or is it after the sex? I would say during sex, give nonverbal feedback. Show through body language, the ooh, eyes. Yes, give it to me good. Yes, primal <laughs> parts of intimacy. But when it comes to real constructive feedback, mm -hmm. which may be things you want to explore, try, do, make that happen outside of the bedroom. And not just at the end of the night, but over morning coffee, yes. when you're on a hike. Make it like any other aspect of your relationship, bring it up, and don't make it a, a, a rush conversation. Really take your time and, and honor that as something important for your sex life. I sometimes have the ability to be, you know, extreme in my delivery. I'm a coach, so sometimes, you know, I can't help myself and I have to remember, I can't always coach my husband, I have to be a wife. So <laughs> I'll pop out my little book right here. <laughs> and I'm like, let's flip through this sex book and try something new and I'll just like, like leave it out and I'm like, babe, 
that. Let's let's try this one. And he's so tired of my antics at this point. He's like, oh my god, I can't put you on a handstand. But <laughs> but sometimes just having like a resource or a tool that you both can swipe, you know, go through, because then he can also look through and like, hmm, maybe I want to try this one. Like this is a you know a new position for us. And that just allows it to not be so much like me telling versus like here's an example of a tool that we can use. Exactly. And you give him the opportunity right. to say is this something I'm interested or not. And remember you're both learning and exploring. So yeah. nothing has to be set in stone. We're doing this. But maybe looking at that can help you open up some ideas. Yeah. Things you might want to try. And I think that helps also build intimacy. Because you're exploring together. You're talking about it. And even talking about things that you maybe wouldn't want to do, but it sparks the conversation is good for, for dialogue. Absolutely, because you can also really, really hurt someone and say something that you can't come back from. Right. <laughs> that, that is very true. Like, how sensitive <laughs> do you have to be, though, in delivering that information, right? Because there's no way to get around hurting someone's feelings when you're telling them that they're not doing something right. Right, right. And I think that's people's biggest fears. Mm -hmm. What if I hurt my partner's feelings? And I would say we want to give room for hurt feelings and not feel responsible for that. Because if your partner feels hurt, it's not always your delivery. Maybe it's just how they're reacting to it or it's bringing something up for them. So I would say choosing your words in a way where, again, you're trying to help them understand how you're feeling. You're not criticizing. I think we, we sometimes use words where we say you're doing this or because of what you did when really we're not talking about how I feel mm -hmm. in my experience so we can choose language where we can have ownership for that rather than putting it all on your partner to figure out and then if her feelings come up give space for that I don't think we can always predict that so we don't want to prevent that or hold back from saying things to try because to avoid of fear that. that if they come up hold space means Listen to how your partner feels, give them space to feel that way, validate their feelings. Again, hurt feelings happen. They're not a bad thing. Oh. All emotions are good emotions. We're going to build a sandwich, right? We're going to tell them something that we love, give them some affirmation first, then what we would like to work on <laughs> after that, and then back with some more love. So that way it's not just throwing, you know, that hurtful thing at them. And give them some ideas of what that would look like. So if you're saying, I want more of this, and then kind of leaving it for them to figure yeah. out, saying this is what it would look like for us to get there. You know, Be creative about giving some solution and not putting it all on your partner. That's a lot of responsibility it and is. pressure. Not only are my needs not met, but now you <laughs> have to fill them and figure out how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So yeah, be, again, collaborative. That's what intimacy and sex is all about. Love it. Okay, communication is key. All I'm hearing is communication, communication, communication. My last question for you is, there's people in relationships, I'm not one of them because my husband is a beast, but there's people who are in relationship that may not be necessarily satisfied with the sex. Right. Is that a deal breaker, right? Is, is that a deal breaker and they should break up with their partner because it's not mind blowing and they've had mind blowing and this person's not mind blowing should they cut them off because it's not mind-blowing? I would say no, because sex can improve over time, but look at what the issue is, because it can be a personality issue where it may be a deal breaker. For example, if the person is just focusing on their needs, they're not open to learning about what you want, mm -hmm. and it's about personality differences that are what I would call kind of perpetual problems. They're not really going to change in the relationship. They're rigid. They're rigid in the bed too. Right. They don't <laughs> see any problem. They're not willing to work on it. But I would say sex is a continual learning process. We're mm -hmm. always, we can always get better at it. And if there's a willingness to learn and be open to figuring out how to improve it, that can be a really great asset to this relationship. So I would say uh, look at that and, and really examine why it's not good. Sometimes our expectations are unrealistic, right? Mm -hmm. I want mind blowing sex the first time I had it with this person because I really am really into them. them. And it's just not okay. You know, we have to be realistic and, and focus not on goals around sex, but more about uh, the connection. Have fun. If you're not having fun and enjoying it, then it's not even worth it going through all of that in order to uh, you know, have a sexual relationship. You really need to have fun and look at what are my priorities around even having a sexual relationship with a partner. What yeah. am I looking for? If you can't answer that, then that needs to be your work before going into a partnership. Because sometimes we have these 
expectations or this, you know, anticipation. We've been waiting, we're very sexually attracted to them, and then the build up, the build up, and then when it happens, it's like, oh, like anxiety may have kicked in, and maybe it wasn't as great. There's a multitude of reasons, but what about the sexual attraction component? What if you have a great candidate? but you don't want to rip their clothes off. I hear this all the time. Mm -hmm. Shout out this to is Love actually. is Blind. Um, <laughs> which I'm like, <laughs> every single person doesn't have to be, you know, when you see them, oh, I want to rip their clothes off. Like There's sometimes. Different forms of attraction. Yes. Exactly, exactly. Uh, you know, that can build over time. And I think that intimacy can help improve that. But I think uh, if you're not feeling any attraction, look at what that relationship is about for you. Sometimes we may have an intimate connection with someone and there's just no sexual relationship mm -hmm. and that's fine if that is fulfilling for the both of you. So, you know, there's different types of attraction and if you're not feeling that sexual attraction right away, sometimes there's other forms of attraction that are present first and that can develop over time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we do have types and that's what we're used to in relationships and we can expand that and sometimes grow that and sometimes not. It really depends on where you're at and the own evolution you've been doing in your relationships to kind of learn about yourself and what you want. But if it's just not yeah. there, it sometimes isn't going to be there, but you really have to do the work to figure out why that is. I've met couples where that's been the case. Mm -hmm. You know, we everything else we connect with, but with sex we don't. But when it comes to sex, they're not willing to do that work because everything uh, else works so well when it comes to sex and it's not great we feel why should we have to put so much work there when everything else works they think that it should just be like natural right or exactly. natural. and exactly. sometimes it's not <laughs> i would say every sex uh, sexual relationship even if your husband's a beast <laughs> But I, but I say that though having guided and told him like I like this I like that I mean he right. naturally like <clears throat> was he was good but now it's great because we both have taken feedback like I seriously started off having like pretty girl sex with him where it was like I didn't have to work as hard and I you know we I wasn't as creative and like he actually made me write an occasion but he was open to feedback as well right. and he actually made me really really good at writing I thought I could write now I know <laughs> Yeah, I love feedback too. Yeah. I always tell my husband, like, let's, you know, let's talk about it. What's working right. really well? I think feedback to me is empowering because you kind of learn how to be better at something. I think both of us are naturally competitive. Yeah. So we're like, give us feedback. We want to get better. <laughs> we want to get better. So it's good. And we've also learned a lot in our relationship how to communicate. You know, it wasn't it wasn't as easy in the beginning we had to really work together to figure out what that is and also learn our strong suits in communication yeah. in the areas that we're just not that great in as long as you own up to that i think you're great you're, and that you're requires self-awareness like i'm not that amazing with this this is probably an area that needs some improving i do that i'm like i'm latina i'm very reactive <laughs> I, you know, use my hands and I do this a lot, but it doesn't mean I, I have to blow up anymore. I'm in the culture. <laughs> no, I think culture it's is a, I'm Latina. <laughs> a big component because we learn a lot of that from our culture and that's normalized. You know, for me in my culture, I learned that if you're not being dramatic when we're having communication, yeah. then you don't love me. You're not caring. You're not present, but that's not, you know, everyone has a different style. Right. So I think we have to take that into consideration, especially if our history is informed. Oh my gosh. Them. That's a great point in communication because there are certain verbal or visual cues that you're looking for for someone to show you that they're reacting to what you're saying and we do get that in a cultural perspective <laughs> so when, yeah and so when you don't see those cues you're like wait you don't care about me because right, you can right. throw your arms in the air <laughs> yeah, South Asian is Pakistani and that is not their culture oh, they're, they're like, more mature they're like wait are you even paying attention to me <laughs> he's like yeah I'm looking at you be very passionate Right like I'm waiting to pull <laughs> down. How long has it been? <laughs> okay, so we're going to pull down right now, even though it's been very, very spicy. But I want to remind you guys that if you are someone who is uh, maybe dating someone who's emotionally unavailable, or you're a guy that's struggling with being emotionally available, uh, physical connection, emotional discomfort, if you're a closed book, if you are maybe negligent to your partner, and maybe some fears around loyalty, even, right? Because that, that's a big one plays a part to and someone being emotionally unavailable, mm -hmm. please, 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 like, create this community that Shannon said, um, you know, talk to your partner, talk to friends, we're available for you guys as well. We want you to be just as comfortable with yourself and equally yoked and be able to provide for your partner the emotional needs that they need, but also take care of yourself as well. So we're gonna end with the show, you giving us the naked truth. If you could have any superpower in the world, what would it be? Any 
superpower in the world? I would want to fly. Oh my god, I love that answer. Because <laughs> I think I just want to see everything, you know? There's so much in the world to see. Well, you're already flying now. Yeah. <laughs> okay, if you could go back in time, if you could travel to any period in your life and relive it, what day, what incident would you travel back to? I would probably travel back to you know childhood actually because there was so right. much that I think I took for <laughs> I, I grew up in the 80s best decade ever I have to say I would kind of go back and you know just uh, you know I think childhood play just remembering what it was like to have the freedom to just be and enjoy life before all the responsibility I love that <laughs> I do miss my childhood sometimes but then I'm like oh no <laughs> You said like, go back just for a visit, right? right? And I'm like, day. Just for the day, and I'm like, my mom would snatch me up and you do the dishes so quick. Um, <laughs> okay, and then last one, if you could swap bodies with anyone for the day and live their life just for the day, who would you swap bodies with? Ooh, probably my husband, actually. No, I love that. I'd love to get his body and just, you know, just a, a male body, like to be actually. him. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I love exactly. that. Shout out to the fellas. Like, she would hop in your bodies and see what it's like. I see how you a male body. You. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. see how people are receptive to you, what the reaction that is. That would be a great social experiment. I would love that. Ooh. That would be a good love TV blind. show. Here's coming. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> in a different body. Right. Like, take, it, take it to a whole new level. Okay, Dr. Shani, you have to let us know uh, where they can find you. Uh, give, the, give us your social, your website, everything. Good, good. So my website is drshannonchavez.com and I'm on all social media at drshannonchavez. And you guys can always play with my Twitter or stroke my Instagram at SpicyMati. <laughs> Go to thespicylife.com. Make sure that you click and subscribe, share this episode, help uh, our fellas out. And there you guys have it. You have just been spiced. Uh -huh.